me just sing Welcome Back and then I'm going And welcome back to York College of Pennsylvania, where WGAL's Commitment 2024 10th Congressional District Democratic Debate continues. We're going to begin this part with a question on gun violence because it has touched the lives of many in the Susquehanna Valley, but the issue of gun control remains a divided one, especially with President Biden calling for a ban on assault weapons. We begin this question with Rick Copeland. So thank you very much for this important question about gun safety and absolutely ensuring that our children and all of our children are safe, not only in their schools, but also in all the other spaces in society. I encourage everyone, please take a look at my website, rickcopelandforcongress.com. You will find extensive coverage and positions where I am taking a firm position on all of these things. It states very clearly, I absolutely support an assault weapon ban. I fired those weapons in combat. They have no place in American society. I can also tell you that if you look at that, you'll see everything from universal background checks to red flag laws to holding parents accountable as they were appropriately today when their children commit violence with crimes and they're negligent in that. So again, I would just ask everyone, compare all of the candidates. Take a look at all of our websites on all these critical issues that impact you. You will find that I am first in terms of specificity on how I'm committing to serve you. Thank you. Thank you. John Broadhurst, you have said you are tired of people offering up platitudes after mass shootings. What specifically do you want done? Uh, well, on that point, I'll agree with Rick. Uh, I am in favor of a complete ban on assault weapons. Uh, this worked under the Clinton administration in the 90s. We saw a very sharp decline in, in homicides and violent, um, violent attacks with, during that period. Um, President George Bush uh, junior allowed that to expire and we saw a spike after that in, in the mortality rate. So that is the first thing that we absolutely have to do. Uh, I would also uh, like to propose that all gun owners in the United States have to uh, purchase uh, insurance, that they are liable for the weapons. However those weapons are used, they are personally reliable for the victims financially. Um, I, I feel very strongly about this for another reason and that is because in the course of my campaign I've um, met many people who have been incarcerated um, and we see that uh, particularly in the black community in Harrisburg and it's a, an epidemic that we're going to have to address. Uh, many of them have been arrested for uh, gun ownership, um, things for which white owners are rarely uh, charged. So there's an inequality in the way in, with, in which we enforce Thank uh, you, Mr. gun Broadhurst. legislation today. Shemaine Daniels, you have been an elected leader in a city that has struggled with gun violence, as we were just mentioning. What must Congress do? Oh, I think a lot of the, we need to actually implement the agreement that Republicans and Democrats reached just uh, last year, two years ago. Um, so a lot of the pro pro those proposals will work. The city of Harrisburg has and experiences gun violence. We have zero dealers, zero gun dealers within our borders. So we can't solve the problem by ourselves. But also need us to really think broadly about gun violence because it's not just about the mass shooting and it's not just about uh, turf warfare. It's also about domestic violence. Those calls are some of the most dangerous calls to our law enforcement officers and we need to start thinking more seriously about domestic violence and violence broadly because that's part of the gun violence conversation. All right. Shemaine, thank you. Blake Lynch, you have spent time with Harrisburg Police's Community Services Division. What steps would you support on the matter of gun violence? In addition to the Harrisburg Bureau of Police as well as the York City Police Department with Chief Michael Muldrow as well as the Carlisle Chief of Police. Uh, Chief Landis, as well as Lancaster, Chief Bay, which I'm sure you know Janelle may know about that being in Lancaster. There are many who we have continued to work alongside to keep our community safe. It is about showing up every single day and what our bravest men and women do is run towards danger. And a 13 year old should not have an AK-47 in between their legs on a traffic stop. That is what we all fear. And I can tell you firsthand that gun buyback programs don't work. I can tell you that what we should do at the federal level is hold manufacturers accountable, but also ghost gun uh, dealers and those who have uh, the capabilities of producing ghost guns. What we also want to make sure is that in urban and rural communities, which Shemaine just spoke about, domestic violence is through the roof. That is not discussed a lot, and it should be because we need to make sure that those rules apply equally to everyone. Thank you. Michael Bryan, what would you do in Congress to reduce gun violence? Yeah, I'll first start with uh, my kind of welcome back to America moment, where my wife and I, we were living in Japan for two and a half years, 
And when we came back, we uh, settled down in Washington, D.C., and went to a pride parade. And if you've ever been to a pride parade, there, you've never seen as much positive energy in your life. But all of a sudden, everybody started running down the street and screaming. And we are kids, our kids were three years old and five years old at the time. And we couldn't run with them. So we hid in a doorway and ultimately waited for everything to pass us. And it was at that point that we realized that we were gonna live in a society where we're not sure when we drop our kids off at school if they're actually gonna come home. And we have to do something about that. And so for me, personally, again, as a Marine as well, I agree with what Rick said, is we have to stop the sale and transfer of assault weapons. Do something about it. Implement stronger red flag laws and stronger universal background checks. And that's just the beginning. And we haven't even, we don't have enough time to talk about hand gun violence, but I agree with Blake on that one as well with ghost guns. Thank you. Janelle Stelson, gun violence has touched a number of communities in the 10th district. What actions must Congress take and do you support an assault on weapons? Well, this one is personal to me. I've been on the scene with grieving mothers upset that their children are the latest victims of gun violence. The public health emergency that is gun violence has to be addressed immediately. This is a bipartisan situation. Everybody wants to be safe. I don't know about you, but I get nervous walking late at night by myself or even with a couple of friends because you never know. It happens everywhere now. I know there are a number of pieces of really common sense legislation in the pipeline in Congress right now that the gun lobby has held up. These are common sense things that Republicans, Democrats, independents, gun owners agree with, like background checks to make sure that the dangerously mentally ill and criminals don't have weapons. And there should never be an instance when military grade weapons are being used by civilians. We gotta keep them out of our schools and off our streets. Janelle Stelson, thank you. Moving on to our next question, the United States has been a big supporter of Israel for many years and including during this ongoing war in Gaza that's divided so many and brought out major emotions for people in the 10th district. Congress, though, gets a say on federal aid in many cases. And what kind of aid do you think should be offered to either side in this conflict and should there be strings attached? We're going to begin with John Broadhurst. Um, I've been very clear on this issue and I'll be even clearer tonight. I think we should cut off all aid all military assistance to Israel should stop immediately. John Broadhurst. Yes, uh, I'm not finished. And it's, um, I want to make one thing clear, that this is a good example of how we deal with consequences, but not the causes. So um, Janelle, for example, has said, and other people as well, that we have to decimate Hamas. Israel has to decimate Hamas. Um, I would say, even if Israel were to decimate Hamas, the cause remains, and that is the illegal occupation of uh, Palestinian territories since 1967. This crisis did not begin on October 7th. That's a very, very long history. So unless you address the causes, there's no hope of uh, dealing with this situation. The second thing I would say is, it's uh, far too late to call for a ceasefire. That is an obvious thing. Now I believe the United States government should call for the creation of a Palestinian state and recognize it right now. And I'd ask all of my colleagues to recognize that tonight. John Brockers, thank you. Main Daniels, what is your view on the aid that's been offered by the federal government, and do you think there need to be more strings attached? Uh, yes, absolutely. We should not be funding anything that uh, engages in violations of con Geneva, con con Geneva Convention rules. Um, we lose our standing in the world um, when we fund the things we say we explicitly disagree with. Um, so the funding I would support is more humanitarian funding, um, and we need to make sure that whatever decisions we're making, that we're thoughtful and diligent in that process and that we're not violating international human rights laws. Shemaine Daniels, thank you. Moving on to Blake Lynch. What's your view on the aid situation and strings being attached to that aid? It is a humanitarian crisis that's taking place right now. I'm glad that President Biden and the administration have finally caught up to where we have been for months. As many of our supporters have said, it only took a week of devastation to see that a ceasefire should have occurred. It only took a few days to understand that eliminating hospitals is just not the way of doing it. And again, I do not have military service right now, you know, uh, currently, or even in my uh, background. 
but I do understand what we have been shown for a long time. We have been, should have been strategically working with our ally partners more to make sure that humanitarian aid was getting there. We should have stepped up more as we do around the world. And I'm glad that the administration is finally there, but I know that there is more that we can do. Blake Lynch, thank you. We've gone to Mike O'Brien. What's your view on federal aid as well as potentially adding more strings to that aid? Yes, yeah, so I'll say as a Jewish American, I stand by Israel's right to exist and defend itself. I'll say that as a Marine, I've flown in combat. I've fought in wars. And what makes wars easier is when you dehumanize the other side. And that has to stop. That's what I'm concerned about is a culture of dehumanization. There's already been enough suffering, enough trauma by civilians, both Israelis and Palestinians. So what we need, I, I also don't concur with the conduct of the war, especially by Hamas, but also by the Netanyahu government. And I'm glad that the Biden administration, the pressure that they have exerted, has finally resulted in additional humanitarian quarters and also a drawdown to the war. I think that drawdown is going to lead towards what I think most of us in this room want, is a ceasefire in return for the exchange of the Israeli hostages and ultimately an end to this conflict. Mike O'Brien, thank you. Janelle Stelson, what is your view on federal aid and potential conditions being attached to it? I am in favor of aggressive diplomacy to get more humanitarian aid to the areas that are struggling so seriously right now. You cannot watch what happened in Israel October 7th or what's been happening for the past six months in Gaza without your heart breaking. This is urgent. People are starving. Their homes are gone. I was just reading in the New York Times today about people who had gone home to some areas of Rafa, um, homes that they had built by stone their whole lives. Those homes are gone. And they are wondering, OK, where do I put my tent so it won't be attacked next? You know, this is where the United States can lead the world, the aggressive diplomacy that helps. We had a ceasefire October 6th. It was violated. I think if Hamas gives the hostages back, including the Americans, we can have a ceasefire again in very short order. We can start working on a two-state solution with negotiated borders so that everybody has a place to live and can feel more safe. Janelle Stelson, thank you. Rick Copeland, what is your view on aid and the conditions that need to be attached to it? So I'm going to start by strongly agreeing with Mr. Broadhurst here. Uh, even though we're competitors, we all agree on some things, and I've heard a number of things. And I'm going to answer you directly. You asked the question of whether or not we support a two-state solution. I do support a two-state solution. I have ver verbalized that in all of our different debates to include the very first one at Widener Law School. I said that unequivocally. And I also said that, you know what? We don't need a war strategy, we need a peace strategy. I also firmly believe, at having served as a peacekeeper in Bosnia and seen the horrors of that environment, that we absolutely have to provide humanitarian assistance to both sides. We have to think in this in terms of a two-state solution where we are helping the people survive and thrive on both sides. I do support an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. I know that that's being worked as we speak, but I also support U.S. leadership, and I said that for the very first day, we have to be involved and we have to be a leader to provide peace in a very difficult neighborhood. Thank you very much. Can I, can I just say something? Since John Broders, you may have a 30 second rebuttal. Yes, since I was violently attacked by Rick, I would like to, <laughs> I would like to reply. I agree with you. <laughs> um, no, I want to say that um, I want everyone actually to call for a Palestinian state right now on the stage, because that is the official position of the United States, and it has been since the early 90s. That is the official position of the State Department and every president since Bill Clinton. That's, that's the truth. So um, when Janelle starts running down the clock because she has nothing to say on this issue, we have to get very worried about it. This is an issue which crystallizes everything that is wrong in American politics today. The indifference to human suffering, the conventional thinking, and the um, refusal to recognize what is already American policy. John Broadhurst, thank you. Janelle Selson, you were mentioned, so we may have a 30-second rebuttal. I would rather spend the time talking about substance. Thank you. I think that was very substantive. Thank you very much so far for what we've heard from you all tonight. We are going to be moving on to our closing statements, and we are going to begin that in the order that we started with the opening statements, and we are going to begin with Blake Lynch. Everyone, it is really an honor to be in your homes this evening and the opportunity to share what 
separates all of us. What separates us is that we have tried different things before and again and again and again. But what you would like is someone who is tested and proven and experienced and also can unite throughout the tent of the Democratic Party what we need to defeat Scott Perry and also deliver for President Biden and Senator Casey. We need the energy, the youth and the vigor, the experience of being not only just homegrown, but experience with what our families experience every single day. I am that candidate. Raising my wife, I'm sorry, raising my kids, my wife and I are really <laughs> excited about. I'm gonna hear that later. You know, really being a part of this experience, being a part of this experience has taught me so much. It has taught me about listening on the doors that we're knocking on and hearing about the concerns of our seniors, our working families, our union members, and many others. And I would challenge you to really test everyone else and look on their websites about what they stand for. Visit ours as well, BlakeLynch.com. Blake, Lynch, thank Blake you Lynch, thank you. Mike O'Brien, your closing statement. Yeah, this election is all about who do you trust to defend democracy and codify abortion rights. It's about electing a congressman that you trust, not somebody that's been voting Republican her entire life after January 6th and then lying to us about it. You can trust me to uphold my oath, just like I did in the Marine Corps. And that trust is personified in the local coalition and supporters that we've been able to build. So George Scott, George Hartwick, Justin Douglas, Sean Schultz, Lisa Kennedy, Gloria Martin Roberts, these leading Democrats have endorsed me because they know that I'm the Democrat that can beat Scott Perry. That I say what I mean, and that when I get to DC, I'll do what I say. So ultimately, I'm asking you tonight to join this coalition, to rewrite the narrative about the future of America, because this April 23rd, this is when democracy makes a comeback. Mike O'Brien, thank you. Janelle Stelson, um, you get one thirty second rebuttal and to begin um, your closing statement. What is your timing like? Do I have a few seconds to uh, talk about Mr. Broadhurst? I just want to say I understand the substance. Uh, I think I'm the only person here. I used to write speeches for a Middle Eastern embassy. My grandparents worked in the White House, and he was the first U.S. ambassador to Austria after World War II, drafted the treaty that divided Vienna into four parts and kicked the Russians out. I know a little something about international relations, so I... I appreciate your substantive response, and I hope you will also respect mine. I think, uh, <laughs> brought her together. Very briefly, I think uh, the lady protests too much. <laughs> okay. Janelle Stelson, for your closing statement. Okay, just saying, you asked. All right, when the Supreme Court handed down the Dobbs decision in 2022, I was live on the set and had to look into the TV camera and tell every woman watching that her rights had been rolled back 50 years. It is a large part of why I'm here tonight. Scott Perry wants a nationwide abortion ban with no exceptions, rape, incest, risk to the mother. He also wants to ban IVF and tell us when, how, and if we can start a family. I was also on the set telling you about Scott Perry's involvement in the deadly January 6th insurrection and how he tried to overthrow all of our votes, everybody in this room. So I'm joining the fight against Congressman Chaos's dark days of division. I am incredibly grateful to be endorsed by many unions representing working people, the painters, sheet metal workers, federal government workers at the Army Depot, the transport workers, mine workers, postal workers, to name a few. And I'm proud to stand with them because they work hard to strengthen our communities and that is going to be my top priority, making sure your voices are heard in the halls of Congress. Thank you, know, you for your time, you. and I sure would appreciate your vote April 23rd. It would be the honor of my lifetime you, to serve you, know, you in Congress. Thank you. Rick Copeland, your closing statement. So thanks very much again for this tremendous opportunity. I want to highlight first and foremost what I did at the very beginning. I am the best person to beat Scott Perry. Let's talk and think pure politics for a moment. I'm the only one up here that, as a Democrat, has run and won twice in a Republican district. And in fact, in 2021, I was the top vote getter. What does that mean? We all know what it means. That to beat Scott Perry in this district, we Democrats have to win a lot of Democrats. We've got to turn out a lot of Democrats. We've got to reach out to communities all over. We've got to win independent voters, and we've got to win Republican voters. I've demonstrated that I can do that. I can do it again because I've demonstrated and I've built trust in our community and beyond. 
You know, I still believe in the tremendous potential and power of our American democracy. And I believe we do face a crisis now, a transformational moment where we can save our democracy and also strengthen it to finally take steps to provide equality for all and government of, by, and for the people instead of of, by, and for special high dollar interests. Thank you very much. Rick Copeland, thank you. John Broadhurst, your closing statement. Um, yeah, I'd like to end by just saying that uh, we have to recognize that the world is changing. Um, we have to deal with uh, climate disaster. Uh, America can no longer um, simply invade and use brute force to attack other countries, nor can we tolerate the use of force uh, or be complicit in it um, around the world, and I'm thinking particularly in the, the Arab world. Um, but I want to say also that, um, so Mike and Janelle and others have said how many um, endorsements they've had, and they're, they're invoking the establishment. Um, I'm telling you actually something very different. The establishment is part of the problem, and we know this. Um, so we're now devolving into a system in the United States, a political system, where the, um, the extremists have already taken control of the Republican Party, and we're going to end up with a one-party system. So the question, therefore, is what type of, of Democratic Party uh, do we want? I think that the Democratic Party should be a party of the people, working people, should be dedicated to the progressive ideals of Franklin Roosevelt and John Kennedy. John Broadhurst, thank you. And Shemaine Daniels, your closing statement. Thank you. So who represents us matters. I've been a part of this community for the almost entirety of my adulthood. I've lived here and I know the struggles of the residents who live here. I'm a mom in a food desert for, in a medically underserved area of the state. I know what it means to have to drive all the way over to the county where Janelle loves to grocery shop or to Philadelphia to see my daughter's specialist. I know that when we do go to a store, the prices are higher than they used to be. And if I'm sent to Congress to represent you, that's what I'll do. I won't just tell your stories. I'm running for Congress to start a new story for Pennsylvania 10. For the past 12 years, we've had a congressman who has not shown up for his constituents. He has spent his time in Washington embracing some of the most radical ideas of a twice impeached and now indicted former president. We all know that Scott Perry isn't serving the people in this district. We need a Democratic nominee who voters can trust will see them, show up for them, and fight for them in Washington. And I'm that Democrat, and I ask for your vote tonight. Thank you. Shemaine Daniels, thank you. And thank all of you for watching WGAL's Commitment 2024 10th Congressional District Democratic Debate. We also, of course, want to thank York College of Pennsylvania. We also want to thank the candidates for being here as well. And again, Pennsylvania's primary election is in exactly two weeks on April 23rd. Polls are going to be open at 7 a.m., closing at 8 p.m. that day. And remember, the deadline to request a mail-in or absentee ballot, that is Tuesday, April 16th at 5 p.m. For more information on how to apply, you can, of course, download the WGAL app to your mobile device. We will have a lot of coverage on this debate and a lot more information about the upcoming election on WGAL and WGAL.com. You can join us on WGAL at 10 and 11 for more coverage of this debate. Have a good night.